performing arts series that pairs art and artists with award-winning authors and performers of regional, national, and international acclaim. Tonight's pairing features the return to this stage of writers Andrew Weiner and Jeff Dyer, longtime friends, tennis rivals, and award-winning authors. This evening, perhaps timed perfectly to coincide with our national mood during this mercurial election year and Britain's post-Brexit blues, they help us navigate the territory of longing and disappointment. <laughs> In the role of a formidable and soulful self-described Dick Cabot is Andrew Weiner, chair of the creative writing program at University of California, Riverside, who so beautifully choreographed the discussion with Colin Tobin this summer. And with him is Jeff Dyer, acclaimed British author, writer in residence at the University of Southern California, described by The Guardian as dry, adventurous, lucid, laconic, open to anything, and, thanks to rich cultural knowledge, the type of person who instinctively stitches moments into greater meaning. Please join me in welcoming them as they stitch together such a moment for us tonight, taking on history, art, the creative process, Brexit, and why, from the personal to the global, what we think we want never turns out to be what we thought it would be. <laughs> Sorry, I went to my heart. Very eager. Can, can you hear me in the back? Yes. I want to thank Patsy and the museum uh, and Jeff who killed me in tennis this afternoon. And if you suddenly hear us uh, moaning up here, it's because of what he did to, to me on the court. Um, like Dick Cabot, I actually prepared for this. Uh, but. Part of it is that uh, in reviewing kind of uh, my friend's work, I had to get my thoughts down. So I'd like to, to read a few of them by way of introducing uh, Jeff and kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, the French Jack Kerouac, Nicolas Bouvier, once asserted that traveling provides occasions for shaking oneself up, but not, as people believe, freedom. He was referring to how the exigencies of travel often force us to forfeit our claims to agency and control. Jeff Dyer is one of, I'm sorry, Jeff Dyer um, uh, deepens and complicates Bouvier's truism by showing us how our encounters with the world are as likely to be compromised by the exigencies of the self. Admiring reviewers often err, I feel, when describing Dyer as having eclectic, wandering tastes. Yes, he does approach the world unsystematically, thankfully, falling in and out of an enchantment, appearing to jump from subject to subject, certainly finding things that are for him significant if still unfathomable, and discarding other things that show no such promise. And yes, he grabs hold of whatever genre suits his subject. Jeff really doesn't distinguish between fiction and nonfiction. Um, but finally, and finally, yeah, he does jump around in time, uh, both in his writing and in, in his adventures. But it would be a narrowing, uh, a narrowing, a diminishment of what he's offering us to call the crux of his work a kind of curiosity. That the secret of happiness is curiosity may be one of the great lies of contemporary culture. Curiosity to Aristotle was a defect, to Aquinas a sin, Robert Burton, whose Anatomy of Melancholy was published in, and was published in 1621 and has been admired by everyone from Samuel Johnson to Nick Cave, recognizes curiosity as a cause of madness. If curiosity is your lodestar, you risk a mind filled with bric-a-brac, which is the opposite of a mind bent like Dyer's on enjoying the best fruits of our civilization and of human experience. Dyer looks into places in history for traces of others, and so for traces of the real. For him, there are some places and some events about which he feels that, if only he could understand them, the whole universe might at once become intelligible. Yet he's deeply cognizant that the process of looking submerges us 
in the stream of imagination and emotion. And his writing, his particular style, constantly enacts this complex negotiation between these two worlds. On the one hand, the tangible world of history and things, and on the other, what would seem to be a hindrance to finding anything tangible, the more metaphysical world of longing, of dreams, of uh, consciousness. In so doing, Dyer pays tribute to the dual structure of reality, composed as, as it is of empirical facts and sober objects, and ephemeral feelings such as desire, gratification, and disappointment. What emerges from the pages of any of his books is a complicated artist, part skeptic, part optimist, I argue. A soul, if you will, that draws on all its powers of reason and wit and irony and apprehension in order to try to comprehend what it knows in the end is pretty much impossible to understand. Not curiosity, then, but the drama of the search. Dyer's art consists of showing himself and us around our human inheritance. Did I mention that he's also really funny? Uh, and that's just it. Each of us inhabits the world carrying a giant thing on our back called a self. Right? And Dyer's found a way to assert the world's personality by deploying his own. His personality is non-doctrinaire, both humble and great enough to permit a view of the circular movement of life. Things vanish, we lose them forever sometimes. But sometimes we also rediscover them, if in very different form. We may think of Dyer's relation to the world, then, as a form of love, if by love we mean a mingling of timeless longings and present desire. And present desire, perhaps because of our time, timeless longings, inevitably lead, leads, as love does, to disappointment. That, this is what Jeff and I hope to talk about a bit today. Uh, what is one to do in the face of that? Jeff's work provides a general but nonetheless profound answer. We should pay attention. And in the end, this may be the message of his work, that attention means as much as love. That we have inherited something here. That if we can understand it, if we can, I'm sorry, that if we can't understand it, we can still try to know how it works, if only on us. Uh, and Jeff, I, I wondered if you could kind of get us started by speaking about something we've all inherited and that is still working on us to this day um, uh, with some kind of uh, ways, in ways that have to do with our longings and our disappointments to such a degree that, that our present political world is being shaped by it. And I'm, I'm speaking uh, about the two great wars, but, but in particular, uh, about about the, uh, the first first war uh, that you've written about so beautifully in, in the about the missing of the, the song. Okay. I know you have a presentation. And... So can I get up? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh wow! Thank you so much, Andrew. Well, it's going to be one of these things that what I say now is going to be so appropriately disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so Patsy outlined the stuff we were going to talk about, but also we decided it would be nice to sort of tie it into a degree with the, uh, the exhibition that's up at the moment. So there'll be stuff about the, uh, the First and Second World War. I was born in 1958 in England, and my childhood was completely dominated by the Second World War, not the actual Second World War. I mean, my sense of history is not so wobbly. I know it was over, you know, well before I was born. But by recreations of it, fictional recreations like uh, like this, a still from that great film. No, not the right <laughs> author, the wrong film. Uh, good, yeah, good guess because of the snowy. No, where eagles dare. <laughs> the cable car scene. Anyway, yeah, it was dominated by you know um, films like this, magazines. Um, here's a, you know. Um, Another picture, uh, there was a big film when I was a, a young boy of the, the Battle of Britain. And what was happening there is that these fictional recreations of the Second World War, something like Where Eagles Dare, it's really just a fantasy, but they were always packed with authentic uh, period detail. And these period details were, you know, verified really by all the documentary records, either photographs, 
such as this one, by? Oh. Yeah, you're getting, you're getting into it now. Um, and, you know, uh, or, or by that documentary series, The World at War. <coughs> but actually the interesting thing is that, you know, that here's something like this, which proves about the, the North Africa campaign, yes, this really was a battle fought by men wearing shorts. <laughs> but, um, uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's, the, 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 the point is that there's this sort of incredible merging of the imaginative and the, uh, the real, the documentary, because, I mean, this is a wonderful sort of photograph, but, uh, you know, uh, the picture is so perfectly composed and lit that that makes us suspect what is indeed the case, that, yeah, although smoke grenades were deployed, in this instance, they were used for aesthetic and pictorial effect rather than combat effectiveness. So all the time, what I want to convey is that the Second World War was, you know, it was being recreated imaginatively and looked back on all around us, whereas the First World War was never like that. But it was all the time around us in the form of these mem memorials. That's the mem beautiful memorial by Charles Sergeant Jagger at Paddington Station in London, which some of you will have seen. Uh, they really were all around. Another Jagger memorial, at uh, that's the Royal Artillery Memorial in London. Wherever you're walking in London, you're coming across these memorials. And indeed, wherever you're walking, you know, you're in some tiny village in England, and the center of the village will always be a First World War memorial. And here's, here's another one. Um, a uh, beautiful picture, actually, showing, you see the way that those actual people are, are sort of ghosting. They've moved slightly um, because it's, it's quite a long exposure. So you get the sense, actually, of just how enduring the presence of the First World War is because, of course, the statue is there perfectly uh, sort of um, uh, depicted, whereas the people feel rather transitory in comparison. So it's all around the First World War. Uh, it's part of the landscape, and this memory, as this picture brings out, I think very powerfully, was constructed uh, from the armistice onwards. I think one of the peculiarities about the First World War, uh, as distinct from the Second, is that it was a very, it's remembered as a peculiarly localized affair. Uh, you know, each nation tends to remember it in terms of one place. So for the French, of course, it was the meat grinder of Verdun. For the Anzacs, it's Gallipoli. But for the British, uh, it's the Somme, um, especially the first day of the Battle of the Somme, 1st of July, 1916. Um, and I think, although officially, what is obviously comm commemorated on, um, on the anniversary of the armistice each year is the final victory of 1918, but the emotional epicenter, the, emo the sort of epicenter of memory, is either the site of the most catastrophic defeat, or in the case of Verdun, a victory the cost of which was so high that it's almost indistinguishable from defeat. Um, and I mean, I'm sort of building up now to one of the themes of, of disappointment. But according to the British historian, military historian John Keegan, he wrote. The song marked the end of an age of vital optimism in British life that has never been recovered. And a really deeply pessimistic analysis, isn't it, of, of what's gone on. Anyway, that may be an exaggeration, but um, what I'd like to add parenthetically uh, is that um, you know, if the if the song was you know marked the age of a, of a, of a vital era of optimism. You know, think about what happened in the Second World War, the Battle of Britain, which is, you know, was remembered by Churchill as our finest hour. But of course, the, the Second World War also really was the beginning of the end of the British Empire, which is what Churchill said we were, we were fighting uh, to, to, to retain. And since then, it really has been a, a story pretty much of uh, continuous decline. Um, but again, it's not so simple, really, because if we talk about the generation ahead of mine, you know, bear in mind I was born in 1958, uh, so if we're talking about, if we consider people in their 70s, um, you know, if they grew up in Britain, in, sorry, in London, then they would 
did something really remarkable. They're always talking about London in that period after the Second World War. On the one hand, it's a period of incredible austerity, rationing, and much of the city, of course, has been, in the East End especially, has been, you know, bomb bombed by the Luftwaffe. But they always talk about their childhoods, about what a kind of weird liberation this was, that these bombed out bits of the city, it was a great sort of magical, otherworldly place where they would have these incredible adventures. So these old blokes in their 70s, they're always, always reminiscing about that. Um, who are these old blokes reminiscing about it? Well, as I say, they're the generation slightly ahead of mine. So they're people like Keith Richards, Keith Townsend. <laughs> uh, and of course, they're the people who so con conspicuously revived Britain's fortunes, who helped, and this is a phrase they all talk about, they helped turn Britain from this drab black and white world into this incredibly colorful world of what's come to be known as the swinging 60s. Uh, that was a parenthesis. We'll just go back to the, to the song very, uh, very briefly. Um, this is uh, uh, a picture of the Cenotaph. Um, there's a, a, one of the anniversaries. The Cenotaph was designed by Sir Edwin Nutchins, who also designed this incredible memorial uh, on the battlefield of the Somme, a memorial to the missing of the Somme. And it's an incredibly powerful place. Uh, I've deliberately not got a picture of it because photographs don't just they just don't convey the kind of the power of this memorial to the missing of the soul. That is to say, is to the all the, the, the people whose bodies were never recovered, who just who who just went missing. Um, and there's when you approach it, there's just this extraordinary sense of both something emanating from this memorial and something converging on it. And for me, it was really the beginning uh, of what uh, has become a, a real so enduring source of fascination for me. And indeed, it's one of the, the themes of, 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 of the, the new book. I'll show one more picture, though. Extraordinary picture, actually, taken, I think, in 1918. I mean, I said that uh, I wasn't going to show a picture of the missing of the soul. But, um, you know, just bear in mind that absent image. So this is a, a picture of the one of, I think it's the 1918 or 1990, 1919 Armistice Parade, where um, uh, there's a, what's happened is that because of the long exposure time, um, this is a place where there was a great uh, a march of, of many, many soldiers down the middle, and the long exposure time has sort of wiped them out. So you've got this incredible kind of uh, absence in the middle of the picture. It's a quite extraordinary picture, partly, of course, because it's, it's in color. Anyway, so this idea of what's missing and absent is very important. But when I visited the memorial to the missing of the soul, it really made me realize that I'm drawn to these places where History is manifest in geography, or to put it, put it in another way, where the temporal is manifest in the spatial. That was the beginning of, a, of an interest uh, of mine, and in different ways it's manifest in some of the places that I write about in the new book, a place that I'm sure many of you have been to, uh, the lightning field, of course, which is crucially an experience of time, of space that unfolds in time. As you all know, you can't just turn up there, have a quick look for a few minutes. You have to spend, spend the night there. Uh, I think it's also something that is, you know, it's, uh, this is the Spiral Jetty uh, by Smithson, a place that I visited. You can see, that's me there. Um, and this kind of thing of the, the power that is there, that, it, that converges on and emanates from certain monuments, I felt that it was brought out so powerfully by this uh, painting by Elihu Vedder. But again, I've been, and in the new book, I talk about uh, this place that I first saw on this album cover. Uh, you know, it's the Watts Towers in, in, uh, East, in East LA. And the new book concerns a number of pilgrimages that we went to. So my wife and I went there to, um, to Watts Tower. And we also made a, a pilgrimage to this place. For a, a less erudite audience, I would have to. Uh, tell you why we went there, but of course you'll, you can see immediately why, why we went <laughs> uh, And I think for now, uh, do you know what that is? It's... Um, yes, who said that? 
Uh, yeah. It's the house where, yeah. the house where Theodora Adorno uh, lived in Brentwood in Los Angeles during the Second World War, where he wrote Minima Moralia. Um, so I think there's lots. Of, there are more pictures. If the talk gets boring, we'll just we'll, we'll go visual. But for now, I think that's just sort of setting up the, the sort of background to this discussion. So thank you. Um, I, I thought I'd read a, uh, very quickly a poem by uh, the great Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, or Herbert we say in America, uh, translated by, by the great Czesław Miłosz. The rain. When my older brother came back from war, he had on his forehead a little silver star, and under the star an abyss. A splinter of shrapnel hid him at Verdun, or perhaps at Grunwald, He'd forgotten the details. He used to talk much in many languages, but he liked most of all the language of history. Until losing breath, he commanded his dead pals to run. Roland, Kowalski, Hannibal, he shouted, that this was the last crusade, that Carthage would soon fall, and then sobbing confessed that Napoleon did not like him. We looked at him getting paler and paler, abandoned by his senses. He turned slowly into a monument into musical shells of ears, entered a stone forest, and the skin of his face was secured with the blind, dry button, buttons of eyes. Nothing was left him but touch. What stories he told with his hands, in the right he had romances, in the left soldiers' memories. They took my brother and carried him out of town. He returns every fall. Slim and very quiet, he does not want to come in. He knocks at the window for me. We walk together in the streets, and he recites to me improbable tales, touching my face with blind fingers of rain. Uh, Jeff, you write in, in The Missing of the Song that World War II memorialized itself uh, from its inception, essentially. Oh, World War I. World War I, sorry, yes, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and by, by ushering in a future characterized by uh, instability and, and, uh, and uncertainty, it embalmed forever this kind of idea of a past characterized by, by uh, stability and peacefulness and this kind of glorious time pre-war. Um, and, and the phrase that really stood out for me uh, in your book uh, about the song was this idea that the Great War was the story of effects generating a cause. Okay? Effects generating their cause. This kind of flip or back backwards uh, Kind of paradigm, and I thought of Iraq and WMD, and how how that was also a case of of the narrative was effects generating their cause. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask you: Do you think that that Brexit is is a case of this, a case of effects generating their cause? And how do you? What's the relationship that you see between Brexit and World War One? And this. Huh. Well, well, yeah. Let's just we were going to sort of just. Ease into it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, actually, uh, Jim, could we, could we, um, you want to go visual again? Uh, let's move on to this next picture. Yeah, I mean, God, we've thought of everything. I mean, so I'm not so sure about World War One, but I think World War Two and Brexit is quite, quite interesting. So here is, here's a picture of a, of a, a I bought this plate. Um, at the street market near me, and it's uh, it's the Goldbourne Road market. Oh, by the way, before we do this, I should say something. So I took a photograph of this with my iPad on the um, on my kitchen table when I was in London, and um, uh, you know, so there it is on the kitchen table. You'll know that I got a bit of the kitchen table in, but you know, I thought that was an accident. But it turns out because we so want everything to tie in that there's a, I mean. <coughs> Paul Strand, 1950. <laughs> 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 Modernism. How do you write them apples? <laughs> so anyway, we'll we'll forget the Paul Strand illusion down the bottom, uh, right hand corner. But yeah, so I bought this plate for at this market. And this market is like a dream of what everyone loves about London. 
It's so multicultural. You know, there's all these people from different parts of the world. There's this kind of Swedish cafe there. There's a Palestinian cafe. It's got all that great, you know, just that great multicultural sort of buzz there. And, I, and things are there are quite stunningly cheap in this city, which is now regarded as so expensive. So I bought this plate for three pounds. And of course, I, I liked it because, I mean, this is the core of English identity, really, the Battle of Britain. You know, we all love that. We love that. The Spitfire is the, you know, the symbol of the, you know, the, the you know, we, we sort of dilute, you know, we, we think that we won the Second World War in the Battle of Britain. Uh, now, of course, we also know that really the Second World War was won on the Eastern Front, blah, 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 but it's really important to us. And I like this kind of Thing. And it's just, so it's this perfect image of the Britain that we fought for, the Britain that, of course, uh, has been sort of undermined by, well, you name it, immigration, um, the powers that be in Brussels or wherever, all of this kind of stuff. And what I really like about this is there's two things. One, I mean, uh, I love the way that, you know, you could imagine this could so easily have been used for propaganda purposes, like these two kids climbing in, you know, you just need to force them a bit and they're sort of, you know, yeah, just put a sort of turban on their heads. Yeah, the country's going to be overrun by, by, by Muslims, you know, so they've got to keep out this kind of thing. And then, of course, it turns out, I buy this plate and it's great, I'm kind of liking eating my breakfast off it. <laughs> my breakfast, not my breakfast. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and then, of course, at one point, I'm about to put it in the dishwasher, and I see on the back, it says something like, Caution, do not eat off this plate. <laughs> it contains stuff that is poisonous. So I thought there was such a great way, the, 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 the great symbol, if you like, of the way that so many of the things that the Brexit, Brexiteers appealed to really were poisonous, you know, and it's... Uh, it was what was remarkable, I think. I was there in London for the, for the uh, Brexit vote. I was really glad I was, um, because I had a sort of, you know, a ringside... So I was there at ground zero, as it were, and living in, in Los Angeles, where you're, you know, you're really a long way from everywhere. The time difference is important. And, you know, thinking about Adorno, of course, who fled, fled Germany, living in Brentwood, um, you know, it's really, I realize, of course, he's safe there, and he's, you know, very, very productive, but something, there must have been an incredible psychic cost to be so removed from, you know, from, from, from what was going on. It never troubled Thomas, his friend, Thomas Mann, because, of course, Thomas Mann had his desk, and he famously sort of said, wherever this desk is, that is Germany. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, well, anyway, I never feel that where my desk is, that is where England is. <laughs> so I was glad to be back there, and I'll never forget the evenings. It was one of these awful, whereas Goldborn Road was this, you know, dream of London, really. The Brexit boat night, it was just this London, the London that we all hate. It was pouring with rain. It was one of these incredible storms. As a result, the transport was all screwed up. And everyone's just in a rage, it's so crowded, and there's this apocalyptic storm. And as I got, I had to cross London to get to my friend's house in the East End. And, you know, but the, in, a, in a way that's entirely sort of appropriate for an apocalypse, of course, everyone's out boozing, you know, and she's, whoa, you know, as the, as the ship goes down, you know. And then you, so everyone pull out, and I come out of my friend's house after the party, they're still out there drinking, and we were all sort of thinking, okay, we'll wake up the next morning, we'll all all we open. Of course, we wake up the next morning, and there we are, living in a different country. And I think the key thing about it is that, yeah, um, you know, uh, people were offered this referendum about leaving the EU, but it was not really what they were voted on. Really, what they were doing it was uh, the vote. The, they, so many people were, were sort of answering this question: How pissed off are you? <laughs> you know, on a scale of sort of ten. 10, which is Brexit, down to, you know, one, stay. Actually, you know, then of course people are saying, yeah, I'm really pissed off, because we have been pissed off, uh, depending on your frame of reference, ever since the Battle of the Somme. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, anyway, you can see it, and it was, um, and then what was extraordinary was how quickly people realised that. Yeah. So, you know, the people who've been campaigning 
uh, for Brexit. You know, they were so you could see the look of, oh my God, what are we going to do now? We yes. won. We never expected to win. We just wanted to give people a chance to to voice their pissed off. Yeah, yeah, we haven't yeah. got a we haven't got a, a plan, and there was such a sense that if we could have rerun the election, the the, the, the Brexit, the, the vote, the referendum a few days later then people might have changed their tune. So, you know, uh, if this is sounding familiar to you, this is sounding familiar to you, you know, I don't want to disappoint you, but I don't really believe that, you know, the possible future president, Mr. Trump, has all the answers, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, uh, I'm guessing that was some kind of answer to your question. Yeah, memory right. of which uh, alludes to that thing. Yeah, anyway. It, can we can we talk about white sands a bit? Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I'd like to ask you about, and I I've been wanting to ask you this a long time actually, about dreaming, longing, imagination with respect to kind of how you are in the world and, and how you present yourself as a writer. Uh, it se it seems to me that our contemporary notion of a dreamer is is all wrong, and I sort of blame John Lennon for this. <laughs> uh, you know, those who imagine the world different from what it is and who try to impose their imaginings on the world as it is, these are the people we tend to call dreamers, right? But isn't it the case, and I'm really asking you this, Jeff, that they are incapable of dreaming? That, and, so I guess I want to ask you, aren't the dreamers, in fact, those who let the world form around them and who are enchanted by whatever happens? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Goodness, what a question. I'm struggling with that one. Could you let me let me yeah. ask you in another yeah. way. Yeah. What kind of dreamer are you? Oh. Are you the kind that's commonly understood in our in our culture uh, as one who imagines change and progress, let's say? Or are you the kind who's kind of, kind of a dreamer who's enchanted with the world as it is? Great question, Andrew. Unfortunately, <laughs> an answer has occurred to me. Um, well, um, you know, I, uh, I'm going to do what I often do in such situations now. I'm going to uh, sort of relay something that John Berger uh, said about this, which seems to me so, so profound. I mean, he talks about all these visions there have been of a, of a utopian society. Uh, which, uh, you know, often these utopian dreams have had catastrophic consequences. You know, so you think of, you know, the most, you know, the, the, you know, the dream of the communist future and what, what the reality of, of life under communism meant. So there's a, a sort of huge dis disappointment there. And this idea that at some point, you know, we will uh, achieve a condition of heaven, a sort of earthly paradise, that is, if you like, by those terms, uh, the, the dream. And then there's a great uh, thing uh, uh, by Berger, where he says, well, you know, let's just imagine that the condition of the world is always going to be closer to hell than heaven. You know, let's just assume that. And he says, you know, this is sort of presumably quite a, a sort of, it's a, it's a sort of kick in the teeth in a way. He says, you know, how bad would that be? He says, you know, what, what difference would it actually make to our, you know, would it make any difference to, you know, our attempts to, to try to make the world an incrementally better place? And he says, no, it wouldn't make any difference at all. It wouldn't uh, reduce our feelings of the need for solidarity or our attempts to, you know, uh, make our particular neighborhood a bit nicer. He says all that would really, all that we would really be saved is, the, is from the, the sort of scale of disappointment. <laughs> Um, and it seems to me that's so pr profound. So to, to that extent, I would very much be on the you know on the side of the uh, of, of the sort of uh, practical incrementalist uh, solutions. On the other hand, though, you know I really do. I mean, if, for instance, where it seems to be okay to talk about this in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in the context of, of, a, of, a, of a, an art museum. You know, I love that book. Uh, of photographs by Joel Sternfeld of American Utopian I Communities. Amazing, yeah. Do you, do you know, all know this book? It's got this, that beautiful format where, so he photographs a lot of these uh, utopian communities of, of, of many, all different sorts from the, you know, the really crazy ones, you know, where it's all, you know, we're going to do LSD and have sex the whole time, and nobody's going to have to do any work. <laughs> they tend to have a rather short 
much nicer. <laughs> uh, but the successful uh, utopian communities have all evolved to the extent that actually they, was, they, they bear an incredible resemblance to the sort of social democratic countries of, of Scandinavia. Uh, anyway, he makes such a, you know, a great observation about this. That, of course, loads of them fail. Uh, but there's something about that utopian impulse that I like very much. And he says quite rightly, you know, that we you know uh, lots of marriages fail, but we don't go around generally saying, okay, well that just shows marriages, you know. I mean, it's so. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of edging my bets uh, <laughs> slightly yeah. there. Let, let me ask you a, a related question. You you write about Gauguin returning to Tahiti, uh, and he's for the second time. And he's extremely disappointed because there. Tahiti's already being developed. Um, but you say something really fascinating. You say, that nevertheless, he, he never lost the kind of sustaining artistic belief that he could turn everything that happened to him uh, to his creative advantage. And I wondered if that's a belief that you hold as well. Oh, my word. I have, absolutely. It's the, uh, you know, it's the, um, um, you know, there are quite a lot of benefits being a, a writer, but that is that is surely the, the top of the list. You know, I mean, at the, I mean, you know, take a, a sort of rather small scale example. You know, it, the, the, this isn't a spoiler. I mean, so the book ends with a, 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 a longer version of a piece that I first published in the London Review of Books. My wife and I just fulfilled the. That's the other thing. There's all these people trying to get into England, you know, or you've got this big sort of fuss about, about immigration. But what, what they never say is, actually there's so many people who are just desperate to get out. You know, they just don't want to come to, you know, to come to America. California. So we fulfilled our dream. We are living in California. We've only been in this, you know, this promised land for a week when, uh, when, I, had a, when I had a stroke. And it was really quite something. It was really, it was really something. You know, it was a dramatic event. Quite early on in that process, though, I realized this is a revenue opportunity. You know, I started to, uh, uh, it was such an extraordinary thing to have happened that I, you know, of course I started writing about it. And uh, it was, um, so that can be turned to advantage. You break your leg, or, you, know, you injure your leg as Oliver Sacks did, and he writes about that. Okay, then we talk about more catastrophic things, the breakup of a marriage or whatever it is. Yeah, so, you know, it's got that redemptive quality. Uh, and I first became conscious of this, actually, I, I think with, a, you know, a, 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 another Californian resident, you know, Art Pepper, the, yeah. you know, who, whose music we were listening to on the drive up. And, you know, Pepper was this, you know, nice, very good looking, quite nice, you know, he played this nice, sort of quite light Californian West Coast sort of jazz, uh, and then you know he loses the whole of the 60s to, to drug addiction and incarceration, ends up in San Quentin, and you know then you know gets out of jail, and uh, the last years of his life, it's the best music he's ever made. Uh, I think there's no question but that the music is imbued with everything he's he's experienced. And, you know, it, there's a beautiful redemptive quality, I think, to, 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 uh, to you know, Pepper, it seems, Pepper is a, you know, an unpleasant character in many ways. Yes. You know, uh, it's difficult to, to deny the redemptive quality of that. So, yeah, yeah. that seems to me the, the, uh, something that we, we certainly can be grateful yeah. for about our, our line of work. Great. I'm not quite done. I want to ask you another related question. You, you write uh, that your enormous capacity for disappointment was actually an achievement of uh, victory uh, in the same essay, I believe. Uh, you say that the devastating scale and frequency of your disappointment was proof of how much you still expected and wanted from the world, uh, of what high hopes you still had. And then you say this. You say, quote, when I am no longer capable of disappointment, the romance will be gone. I may as well be dead. <laughs> uh, so my question to you is, are we talking about optimism here, actually? Uh, do, and do, you know, for all of us here, do, do we need to fashion ourselves into sort of a, almost a pessimistic and sober Don Quixote to enjoy or, and to have hope in a damaged and disappointing world? Well, I, I think we might have to talk about national differences here. <laughs> uh, because, you know, if we can just keep simmering at the back of our, our mind, you know, that thing of the song and, you know, what, that, the thing that 
Kingdom says about the soul, which I think is such a sort of wild e exaggeration in a way. But it is so, you know, the, the First World War was this, after it was over, you know, nothing, you know, it's pretty well accepted now that the, the, first, the, the first world, the conclusion of the First World War accomplished really, what did it accomplish? Well, it really laid the seeds, it, it set, did the groundwork for the re, for the for the Second World War, really. So it's a, it's a sort of a, 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 a pyrrhic victory. So that's, you know, there, there's that sort of hanging over us. So of course, it's so different to the American experience of a world war, the American Civil War, where, you know, the Gettysburg Address talks about how, you know, you know the, there was an obvious point in the American Civil War, which the First World War seemed, seemed not to have. And I think just in so many ways that thing of, of, of disappointment is so, is so very British, really, um, particularly the acceptance of disappointment, really. And I think it's that that I, uh, that I sort of, that, that I, uh, that's the prick that I kick against, I think. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think that's the sort of English thing. Uh, it, in me speaking, but I do believe absolutely in that sort of sentiment uh, that I uh, that I expressed, because um, the opposite of you know, if you're if to render oneself incapable of disappointment, you would have to have uh, you would have to just have this incredible resignation. Really, I think uh, I'm very convinced that you know the the you know that the romantic longing. Uh, has as its flip side this capacity for disappointment. Absolutely. You know, so you know, we were going to. I know we're, we're probably not going to do it now, but yeah, there's so much of Wordsworth in that, and you know, the, the bulk of Wordsworth's life, you know, is he's, he's engaged in this disappointing labour of rewriting the Prelude, uh, and you know, <laughs> like he just can't, can't, you know, can't quite, can't quite manage it. Anyway, that's yeah. a, that's a, a side issue. Let's let's stick to disappointment for a second. Um, there's, there, there's what we long for, uh, and, and, and then there's the kind of factual isness, for lack of a better word, of the, of the world, right? So, which, so our experience, our actual daily or minute by minute experience, moment to moment, amounts to mood and mind filtering the facts and phenomena of the world, right? And in your essay on Adorno, Pilgrimage, you describe moments when this duality seems to disappear. Uh, and, and you write, you say, the, quote, these fleeting instants in which we catch a glimpse of a unified world, of a universe in which uh, the discontinuous realities are nonetheless somehow implicated uh, with each other and intertwined so that there's momentarily affected a kind of reconciliation between the realm of matter and that of the spirit. Now, you're actually quoting some yeah. Jameson there. Uh, but it seems to me that you're you're always on the lookout for these moments. Mm. That, you know, I've known you long enough you now, and it's in your work. And for example, in your essay, Forbidden City, where you, you go to Beijing, at one point you're on a rooftop in Beijing, and everything comes together externally. Mm. There's there's the company you're in, there's the environment, the bar, the drink you're holding. It's all the perfect combination. Uh, and you and you kind of say in that moment in the piece you, you write I was finally able to give myself entirely to the moment yeah okay so is that is that the lesson that everything needs to come together outside of, of ourselves in order to give ourselves to the moment hmm. yes but you also need to be in the right the appropriate state of, uh, of receptivity uh, mm -hmm. I think and also, of course, it's, it's possible that that particular moment of coming together, that had all the elements that I wanted, but it might not have been uh, 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 someone else's uh, um, uh, idea of bliss. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we want to sort of, I mean, I, I, it's that, I mean, I think it comes back to that, you know, for Nietzsche, that idea of the eternal recurrence, this idea that you would live your life over and over again without any change. So in a way, it's this kind of, I mean, what he's saying with that, the idea that you're going to live this life throughout all eternity, um, over and over again. Um, well, he says, you know, for most of us, actually, that's a terrible prospect. <laughs> but have you ever known a moment when, you know, you would say to the person who told you this, you are a god, never did I hear anything more divine. 
And I think there are so many uh, 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 moments in our life when we when we say yes to uh, to that. But as you know, as Nietzsche then goes on to say, he says, yeah, but if you've ever said yes to a single moment like that, then you've said you've said also said yes to the thousand woes that are uh, attendant upon it. But I think that's sort of what I'm what I'm doing in that. You know, I was I, I was yeah, it was this kind of peak experience, if you like. And I think those moments are characterized by that real sense of just kind of your being um, both sort of in the world and sort of the, the, the kind of heart of your own life in, in, in a way. And for me as a writer, I've always been keen to preserve those moments and again to go back to the romantics and the prelude. You know, it's that the famous lines in the, the prelude where Whereas I said, you know, there are in our existence spots of time. He talks about these these moments in time, and for Wordsworth, they're you know they're they're located pretty much in his childhood. Yeah. So again, he's all the all the time trying to uh, get back to them and re rearticulate them. But for me, they they they've continued into my adult life very definitely. And yes, of course, I'm I'm I'm, I'm wanting those things, and. What you've described is there's the you know it's a kind of romantic social evening, but also I'm very conscious sometimes it's not something that's dependent on other people. Sometimes it's just a just a place that uh, that that uh, that uh, where I have that sense of I mean, I've likened it before to this thing where you know it's just like if it's, as though one has some sort of Geiger counter in one and one just approaches a certain place a certain moment. And you can just feel that that the, the, the sort of radioactivity in the in a sort of if there's such a good a thing of good radioactivity, <laughs> just feeling that sort of shimmer of possibility, I guess. Let me ask you about that spot of time that spots of time that you've experienced and talked about. And let me let me do it this way. Uh, Simone Weil writes uh, that we manufacture the future in our imagination, and that only the past, when we don't remanufacture it is pure reality. She says that time as it flows wears down and destroys that which is temporal, so that accordingly there's more of eternity in the past than in the present. And, and I, thought, I thought when I read this of, of kind of some key moments in White Sands, and really of all your books, um, when I read this, the next thing she says, she says the past uh, not when the imagination takes pleasure over it, but at the moment when, for whatever reason, it's called up before us in its purity, is time colored with eternity. The feeling of reality in it is pure. The past then becomes something real, but absolutely beyond our reach, towards which we cannot take one step, but instead turn ourselves so that it, an emanation from it may come to us. Then and there we have pure joy. There we have beauty, she writes. I wondered, uh, and, and I, might, I might as well go on to the, the very next thing she says. She says, monotony is the most beautiful or the most atrocious thing. <laughs> the most beautiful if it's a reflection of this eternity she's talking about, but the most atrocious if it's a sign of unvarying perpetuity. It is either time surpassed or time sterilized. And I think of your experience in the fields of the Somme or the Tiki in, uh, in Tahiti. How important to you is this idea of, of a kind of a pure emanation from the past that comes to you? And, and then I want to ask you what the relationship of boredom might have with that. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll say that about, I'll say this for Dick Keller. He would never lay a Simon Bay quote. <laughs> 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 Uh, I, I, I sometimes do feel that in these sort of moments, there is these sort of peak experiences for me are characterized by this falling away of, of, of time. Um, and, you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the joke that I make in one of the books, I can't remember which one, is that the thing about eternity is a little bit of it goes an awful long way. <laughs> um, and That's so, so British. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, um, goodness, jeez, um, I think I'm struggling. Here. Yeah, let me help. You. Let me help. Quite you. A dense, it was quite yeah. difficult for me to yeah. assimilate all of that. Right. It's one of my questions that just brings everything to a stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
of the Watts Towers and of certain jazz musicians, which, which you just actually mentioned with Art Pepper. And yet, while you're on your way to these things, you'll be complaining about parking in LA, you know, or even in, in the book on the song, he writes about he and his friends are making jokes about the windshield wipers using the vocabulary of yeah. war. Uh, so there's always a sense of follies and foibles kind of attending your, your kind of these, these, this, these serious uh, participation, and that humor, in a way, is a sort of distancing, uh, we, we might say. Uh, but in the same piece um, uh, on, on the song, you, 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 we can see that the tragically imbued dyer kind of dances with the carefree dyer, yeah. right? Uh, the, the carefree dyer is always interested in kind of local drives, <laughs> local gratifications, and disappointments, often. Um, I, I guess my question is about humor. Is your use of humor, in fact, of a piece with your view of your and our insignificance? Is it a sort of spiritual position, almost? Well, sense? lots to un unpack here. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing, I mean, first of all, one thing to, to clear up, if you visit the, the battlefields of the Somme, for, uh, you know, uh, as, as I did uh, for the first time in the, you know, in the summer, the thing about it is it's unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. It's just gorgeous sort of Arcadian landscape in a way. So I think there's this kind of quality. One wonders, you know, if in, I'm not, I actually haven't, you know, I, there's sometimes you get the sense that maybe some compensatory quality is, is at work, where something so terrible had happened. And I think it's in Dennis Winter's book where he talks about the way that uh, more shells were dropped in this, you know, per square inch in the Battle of the Somme than anywhere else in, in the First World War. But maybe there is some compensatory quality because it looks so lovely. But the remarkable thing about the, the Battle of the, the about the area of the Somme is that what happened there uh, is literally coming to the surface all the time. So all of you know, when the farmers are, are, are plowing the fields. All the time, this kind of uh, uh, you know these munitions are turning up, and constantly, all you know, bodies are 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 are, 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 are re-emerging. So that kind of horror is underneath it. But while you're walking along, it's just, it really is it really is absolutely idyllic. Mm -hmm. um, an old girlfriend of mine used to joke about me. She, she called me. She used to always call me this little apotheosis seeker. I was always so hungry for an apotheosis, and in some ways, I think that sort of irritability that you've described when I'm on the way to these things, in some ways, it's just a sort of impatience for the, you know, for the peak experience and a transcendental thing. Yes. Um, the other thing is that I'm absolutely incapable of faking it. You know, that old what's that old joke that you know women can fake orgasm, men can fake entire relationships. <laughs> but, uh, when it comes to these sort of peak experiences, I mean, I, or just sort of big art experiences, I'm never able to fake it. I want to have it. So, for example, I went to the, you know, the Rothko Chapel. I'm really looking forward to it, ready to have the big Rothko experience. And it just, you know, and I could... I could have, I could sort of lie to you and say, oh yeah, amazing, man. Yeah. But it just didn't happen. It was yeah. just this complete, you know, any kind of ometer I had just didn't. I had this exact. Did you? Yeah. yeah. So disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, so there's that. I'm just being sort of honest, really. I'm articulating what I, what I, what, what I'm feeling. Um, and okay, uh, you know the. Uh, in Tahiti, you know, the Gogan experience is, is pretty uh, disappointing. What I'm struck by is that so often, when you go somewhere for that particular thing which doesn't deliver, in that similar way where I talked about the compensatory quality of, of sort of nature, nearly always out of the side of your eye, or incidentally, something will happen that will that will make it worthwhile. So, in the case of that visit to Tahiti. Um, you know, I came across this football pitch, which it turned out was I felt had some power on this little this little statue. Okay, there's there's that. So that's the the sort of 
Yeah, they, um, and then this thing of humour is, is, is quite, is, is absolutely so, got it so absolutely at the core of my, of my being. Yeah. But I disagree with you totally, because you see, I don't think that it, the humour serves as a distancing thing. Yeah. On the contrary, I feel it's part of that thing of faithfully articulating it. Mm. So that really, you know, when you're at the, at the psalm or whatever it is, uh, yeah, you could, I could, you know, I want to be fully receptive to it. But just as in any interesting conversation, you know, you can flip back and forth between, yes. you know, joking and seriousness. Yeah. And I feel like on the, on the, I feel like I don't want to be one of these people condemned to the solemn idiom all yes. the time because that's going to leave out a whopping great part of life. Yeah. And equally, I certainly don't want to become some sort of. Uh, you know, there is a British tendency to this, the person who kind of can go anywhere in the world and as we say in England, take the piss out of it, you know, yeah. just by that sort of English sarcasm and just, to, yeah. you know, just to sort of go around the world sort of raining on the world's parade. Yeah. That seems to be a very yeah. unworthy it thing, is. you know, because I want to be capable of, so I want to be able to really, really uh, laugh at stuff right. and be a hundred percent receptive to rapture and all this kind of stuff. Yes. Crucially, I mean, so yeah, I feel it's it's not about distancing, but it's really sort of it's about immersing myself in it. And also, crucially, the humour thing. What, what humour is definitely it was it was. I'm quoting somebody else now. That writer Alexander Hemel. Oh you know, yeah. Who uh, you know because he's from the Balkans, of course he's necessarily got a highly developed sense of humour. Because it comes from a basically tragic place. Yeah. And, you know, it's really not... People sometimes have this idea of humorous writing or funny writing. Yes. Um, that it's... I mean, it's certainly not just something you sprinkle on like a kind of seasoning after, you know, just to give it a kind of thing. It, it's absolutely so intrinsic to one's whole world view. And the other crucial thing... And I I can't remember who was it made this distinction which I learned a while ago, which it made, means so much to me. You know, we must never forget, God, that's what we say about sort of the First World War, never forget, you know, um, that you know, the opposite of funny is not serious. Yes. The opposite of funny is not funny. Yeah. So being funny is so completely compatible with being serious. serious. So yeah. you can be laughing and joking, or you know, as I was with my friends at the song, you know, and it's not offensive, disrespectful, or anything yes. uh, like like that. You know, yeah. it's yeah. I, and this one of the things I love about about reading you is, is the combination of the serious and and the kind of uh, taking into account what's funny in the world. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, because otherwise, of course, then you've got that. I mean, it's one of the reasons I love Annie Dillard so much. Yeah. You know, the problem with so much nature writing is the ease with which you can uh, slip into preciousness. Yes. Whereas with Annie Dillard, you know, a really profound kind of metaphysical observation will immediately be followed by, you know, a really fantastic guy. Yeah. I just have to admit, by the way, something you said, I have to mention this. Does everybody here know who Philip Larkin was, the English poet, who so embodies this kind of. The, the kind of Brit who could go anywhere and and write something that just takes us right down, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I think of his poem "May You Be Ordinary" on the on the birth of Sally Amos. Right? Uh, but I, but one thing that we in America what we do is we get together, we read Philip Larkin at a party after drinking a lot, and we laugh at how uh, uh, somber yeah. these poems, yeah, are, yeah. you know. Uh, um, but, you know, let's, again, let's not forget that in Anne Arundel too, you know, he visits this place yeah. and he, uh, you know, he sees those lovely, uh, he sees the two and he says, you know, this makes our almost instinct almost true. Yes. What will survive of us is love. Yes. So, Larkin, yeah. before he just completely pickles himself in booze and yeah. in bitterness and disappointment, yeah. you know, it's capable of the uh, in, kind of, uh, of lovely sort of yeah. affirmation. Incredible. You know? Yeah. Let me... Um, let me, uh, I, and this is kind of one of the last questions, and it's 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 more philosophical <laughs> than if I have it already. We got Heidegger in the original trilogy. And and here I go quoting uh, Santiana, but uh, he says Santiana writes, "When a person realizes his or her own, and we're back on insignificance, by the way, when a person realizes his or his or her own insignificance by that act." he or she becomes more than insignificant. 
And this would seem to be in line with Eastern philosophy and, and kind of post Copernican uh, revolution you know, thought in the West, of course, um, both of which depose humans from the center of things, right? Uh, and, and now, uh, more recently, science and, and, and academia, this, there's this thing called post-humanism that some of you are familiar with, which has only pushed us farther out from being important in any way um, possible. And yet, to return to uh, this, the negotiation that your work engages in uh, between the world as it is and our experiencing of it, uh, and we really were just talking about that, I feel, with the humor stuff. Uh, would you agree that the universe is significant to us only as it belongs to us in feeling? Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that its size, its longevity, its multiplicity are not in themselves significant, but only as they affect our lives, our ideas, our emotions. Uh, so that's, that's kind of one, one thing I want to ask you. Uh, again, could you rephrase that? <laughs> Let me put it in terms of the battle of the song. Because <laughs> that's something we can all relate to. <laughs> Doesn't the enormity of loss of, of human life in that battle, and Ed Verdugan as well, uh, just to take that as an example, suggest that we've made some kind of gross mistake by deposing ourselves uh, from, from our place in the center? Uh, because it's allowed us, uh, allowed the individual to be, degenerate into a kind of a means to an end, you know, and made intellectually possible all the kind of terrible enormities of, of society. And I guess why I thought of this with you is because you have a way, a very special way, I think, of writing about these, uh, a tiki that has been there for who knows how many. Should we say what a tiki is? Yeah. Way, should we? Mm -hmm. um, it's this little, I mean, uh, throughout French Polynesia, there are these little statues to gods, quite, they're quite, they're, they're very, very stocky, not aesthetically lovely at all. Uh, yeah, they're sort of, they're yes. little sort of, sort of shrines, or yeah, yeah. God, statues of gods, isn't it? That's yeah, and so you, you have this way of writing about these things that have been there forever, and, and not just human things, but, but kind of timeless, natural places as well. And yet, you, wherever you are, you seem to as I said, you seem to reveal its personality through your own personality. And even as you, you talk about peak experiences, it all seems to f still filter through you. That's why I keep talking about this, this kind of the world as it is on the one hand, and yet this kind of filtering through the self, the personality, mood, humor, all that on the other. And so it struck me, this idea, this, this idea of, well, humans aren't important. Let's push them out from the center. Uh, as kind of the primary subject position, as it were, to use a more academic phrase. I guess I wanted to ask you if you thought about, about this approach that you, you really do traffic in of talking about massive things that we really can't comprehend, that seem transcendent or so beyond us, that tap into the kind of agelessness of the cosmos, and yet it's through this, this thing called Jeff Dyer, and with all his attendant <coughs> longings and desires and disappointments. Yeah, well, that's quite a that's quite a sort of un, uh, that's a not unusual thing for for writers, uh, I, I think. But of course, one is interested in these, you know, big issues mm -hmm. um, and things. But we all know that the, the way to uh, you know arrive at some sort of uh, universal truth is by an absolute fidelity to uh, the you know you, your uh, fidelity to the peculiarities of your uh, of your own circumstances and the, the vagaries of one's own nature. Yes. So that, for example, well, if, if I was writing about that statue type thing, you know, I could kind of remove myself from it and give a, an account of, of what it is. But I think it's more interesting, often, and more revealing, and strikes a chord with more people, if that's being done from a completely, um, yeah, from a particular point of view. And so for me, I mean, people sometimes have complained that there's too much of me in these books. But actually, I, I think, really, I'm not particularly, um, I don't think as a, I think in the sort of scale of self-absorption of writers, I think I'm either right in the middle or sort of in the sort of lower. <laughs> what I do have, uh, what I, is, you know, I'm, uh, 
from my point of view, I see my sort of self as like a sort of canary in the coal mine in a way. Yes. You know, I send myself in to these places, and then you know, and I sniff around, and sort of then I report. You know, that that's in a way I'm. I mean, the, one of the key things about my books is that they could never, I could never employ a researcher, yeah. you know, the way a historian could. The only researcher that can do the research I need to be done is me. Yeah. And, you know, I'm always available. My rates are very, very low. And in terms of delivering the kind of findings of the research that I, as an author, need, I'm really perfect for the job. <laughs> so that is my rather sort of modest answer to that. And the author, you know, the author me, you know, of course I like these whopping great uh, uh, issues, but, you know, it's one of the things I address in the, the book, you know, I, I talk about that big Gauguin painting, you know, which I saw just again recently, a couple of weeks ago in Boston, what's it called, where are we going, where are we going? what are we doing, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, of course those are the kind of, um, questions that we're drawn to, but, you know, actually the truth is that the answers are always, always come in rather uh, sort of itemizable or incremental form, you know, and actually they rather, they're often rather trivial, so, um, and I found the answers that people have tended to give, um, the more detailed and specific uh, they are, the more I tend to like them, which is why probably, you know, I'd be more drawn to the way that uh, writers such as Annie Dillard uh, uh, um, address these things, rather than the more abstract kind of philosophy, which I struggle with, you know, I'm one of these people I can only understand the, the, the philosophers who aren't regarded as proper philosophers by philosophers. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think I think that one of the things that there's a certain kind of comfort that your work offers is I think of the essay on trying to see the northern lights, right? And it's something we all have these kind of I, I hate this phrase, but bucket list type thing like I need to see the northern lights, right? Uh, and so you decide, or actually your wife decided that you needed to see the northern lights. Yes, it was then up to me to try to arrange a free trip. So I <laughs> and but but everything but seeing the Northern Lights unfolds. I mean, it's just an unbelievably horrific trip in, in the details, anyway. Yes, uh, but again, it's an illustration of what we were saying uh, earlier. You know, it was it was. I mean, there's several things about this. One, it was so awful, it was hilarious. Yes. Uh, and it was hilariously awful while we were experiencing it. <laughs> And then, of course, always, you know, I was conscious that it was really, you know, in terms of what it would yield to the to the writing, you know, it yes. was it was it was, uh, it, was, it, was uh, it was very nearly perfect. But let, me, but let me so that's the writer's kind of take. But let me relate it to to Piedmont here, and, and this is kind of my closing thought about it is that about you and the whole you thing really is that is that is, and I love this this way that you you're very Nietzschean actually in this way you flip disappointment into a, a positive you flip the negative into the positive and I think that that's oh uh, that's good advice for all of us you know you, you go up to the northern lights and nothing goes right and yet and, and but what happens and it's in every almost every essay in this book what you you start out seeking one thing but you find something that you weren't searching for. Uh, yes, there's almost no. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that, that that is absolutely uh, true. But uh, you know, to that extent, I could live here for thirty years, and I would never be able to have that full California, you know, uh, <coughs> embrace the positive kind of thing. You know? yeah. uh, I have a big kind of, uh, uh, you know, I have. I'm dragging around this huge. You know, uh, legacy of English negativity, <laughs> as well, which I, I I long to transcend, but I would be lost with lost without it. But I and, and, but I think you misunderstood. I mean, I'm not advocating. And Nietzsche, believe me, was a very ill human being, yeah. uh, and, and he was not exactly a, a you know a bundle of light uh, lightness. Uh, but he was funny though. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is that you you indeed really do go through disappointment and all that. I mean, I think because you are a romantic at heart in some ways, yeah. and you want these peak right. experiences, you 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 endure and put yourself through more disappointment than any, almost anybody I know in a way. 
And so, but that's, so, so I don't think it's, it's the California. Well, I see, yeah. Actually, in Australia recently, you know, this is a thought I, I had. I, I was, I'd been asked to write something for the New York Times with a travel issue, and I couldn't go because I, I couldn't do it because I was going to Australia. Didn't have any spare time. And then when I was in Australia, I remembered and heard about it. It's a place that I'd heard about several times before. Lake Disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, if only I had the time to go. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me of a town I bet you've driven through in Arizona called Why. Why? I've not been there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, anyway. I, the, and I guess the, other, the, the final thing I want to say about this, and just as a clarification, is that I think that one of the points, the most poignant, significant significances that I take from your work is that it, it, it's to take your eye off of the end and to focus more on, on the getting there and what the process, right? And I think that's, that's something that, that is kind of uh, not, not a bad way to proceed in life, not just for a writer, but for, but for all of us. Right? Yeah, and also I mean, a version of that is this idea of some sort of how a life, a life can't be uh, assessed chronologically. Mm -hmm. So I always think of this in terms of, uh, obviously, athletes, you know, for whom, uh, you know, the, the peak experiences of their lives are going to come so young. Yeah. But also in sort of literary terms, you know, I think so much, you know, it's one of these, I keep waiting to have this disappointing experience. I, I reread on the road every couple of years, and I keep waiting to have the orthodox dogs experience, whereby, you know, you read it when you're young and it's great, and then you read it as an adult, and you think, oh, this is just cool. Well, for me, on the road just gets better and better. better, better. better. It's yes. just, you know, it just, it's just, you know, amazing. I think of, when you think of Kerouac, you know, and of course he ended up, ended his life as this rather pathetic, you know, drunk, living with his mum, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, Kerouac's life was a triumph. Yes. He had this great, uh, this incredible ambition and drive, yes. you know, to, to, to become a great writer. Yeah. You know, he discovered how to do it. Yeah. And then, as uh, so there's a long period where he can't get published, this kind of stuff. And <coughs> he then lives out his, the rest of his, you know, relatively short life in the wake of that thing. But, you know, so the, 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 the great. So, you know, the Kerouac's life was a triumph yes. in spite of everything that, yeah. that, that comes later. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that Nietzsche is, is the other version of that, where his life was a triumph, and then he gets, he loses his mind. And then, so he doesn't have to live in the wake of his greatness, because he doesn't even know who yeah. he is. But also, <laughs> not the end of Nietzsche's life as a writer was one of the resounding failure. You know, I, I, I think, what was it, human or to human sold so so few copies that you know that it was just yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a chapbook yeah <laughs> it was a, a sort of disaster yeah. Um, yeah well I think I think we're I think we I think we we that's a nice note to end on <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think if, if we have time for some questions yeah let's have some I've got a mic just to take you if you have questions so mm -hmm. raise your hand if you do and I'll come to you. I've had enough of this trivial conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's serious. It's just serious and heavy now. Okay, I got really caught with Noel. Um, what do you two think of uh, Bob Dylan winning the Nobel Prize? Oh, that's a great question. Do you want to go first, Andrew, or I can? I'd rather you go. I mean, we've talked, we already talked about it, so I want to say, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, uh, Dylan is so obviously like, like super. Supreme genius of our time, of you know, of the you know, of the post-war period. It's great that he he's got it, um, and you know the only thing the only the only thing that makes me qualify that is that it's really important for me that uh, that we don't have to buy into this idea that you know Nate Dillon is is somehow great because actually it seems to me that's just uh, the stuff he's doing now. The voice is so shot. The music is just so devoid of interest, but that doesn't matter because it's a it's a it's a recognition of you know of, of what he uh, what he'd done um, you know before then. So it's it's one I, I can't think of any artist of the post-war period who's greater than, than Dylan in, in any area. Uh, what about you, sir? What are your thoughts? I think it's a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but. Um, 
you know, the Nobel Prize in Literature is frequently a travesty. I mean, if yeah. Bob Dylan can win, then um, Borges never won. And go, yeah. go figure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Oh. Yeah. I, yeah, I, 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 I lean toward you, but I'm a little more agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I won't say more. I think. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an outright insult to all of you. That I I'm an author, mm -hmm. and it took me 20 years to get my first book out, and I was a psych major, and you know, I didn't know that, and it was a small, but you know, it was a good book, and and. Um, Bob Dylan has never written a book, has he? Yes, he yes. has. He wrote a great book for No, I also, so. let's not forget Tarantula. Oh, I, I never read his book. <laughs> yeah. on, I just heard his songs. I love his songs. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, what has he written? What, what, what are the titles? I have no idea. Chronicles. Chronicles is a count of uh, various sort of five phases in his life. Is it amazing? Amazing book. It's very beautifully written. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. He didn't make the best seller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, I mean, what is not the reason? I mean, it, uh, all I would say is this. It's, you know, I love being in America, but Donald Trump does make me rather proud to be, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually inconceivable that someone like him could have got, you know, could get to this position. So we can talk about, you know, uh, Farage, who's, you know, an altogether less repulsive figure. But, uh, you know, uh, Farage, there's more of the spectrum. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, uh, but you know, in terms of the kind of people who voted for for Farage as a you know a, a, as a as a potential prime minister, it would, it would be it would be minuscule. It would be minuscule. Right. And I guess the only other thing I've did, God, I'm not going to say anything I haven't heard a, a, a thousand times before, but it is quite extraordinary to me this thing that you know when that tape emerged that. If he was somebody who was in, I don't know, an American football team, you know, a thing where you're not really there, it's not required that you have a highly developed intellect and grasp of world affairs. Just for being kicked out of the team and, you know, lost all the sponsorship. So it's quite extraordinary to me that somebody can still be a president. So that's my rather inadequate response. So thank you for bringing us a full circle with the idea of lobbying and disappointment. <laughs>